you know, one of the things that I hear a lot of is, you know, that mRNA thing is crazy. This is totally sci-fi. It's completely experimental. Why would anyone subject themselves to something that is so risky and so unproven? Um, a little while ago, I wrote something on this topic, um, trying to make the point, I don't know how convincing it was, that actually it's not as experimental as people think and that this technology has been around for decades, plural. Um, and that the only thing that's new is that this is the first time the final step has been made, which is actually taking a, you know, a virus that is uh, of concern to humans, sequencing it, and then, you know, putting it into a clinical practice. But this notion of using mRNA uh, has, you know, this didn't just come out of nowhere. This wasn't something that was developed in 12 months, as one might believe if they weren't really following the science too closely. Uh, do you find yourself confronted with the same type of question? Yes, and they're a reasonable question. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, it is a new era of vaccinology. I mean, you, we just went through that briefly, but it's arguably the fifth era. I mean, you, you go to sort of initially sort of animal strains that are related to human, then you go to the inactivated vaccines, then you go to the live attenuated viral vaccines, um, then you go to purified protein vaccines. What all those four strategies have in common is that you're giving the viral protein that you're interested in. I mean, in this case, we're interested in the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. But that, and, and when you give that protein in one form or another, whole virus or a live attenuated virus or just the purified protein itself, um, you're, you know, the, you're giving that protein, the viral protein, then the person makes an antibody response to that protein. You're not doing that here. You're giving the gene that, that codes for the viral protein that's translated in the cytoplasm to the viral protein. So your body makes the viral protein, then your body makes an antibody response. And you can see why people are, are concerned because it, it's the term that is used correctly is it's a genetic strategy. You're giving a gene. And the minute you say that to people, that's often interpreted as something that could, you know, could interfere with your genes or, you know, re orient or re-engineer your genes. That's the way people hear that. They hear it as gene therapy. And in a sense, it is kind of gene therapy, but not uh, in the more traditional way that it's meant. So what is the best answer you have to someone that says, look, I'm not worried about acute toxicity or even subacute toxicity? Because given how many tens of millions of people have received both the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, I think anybody can say unequivocally, there can't be any complications in the short run that are clinically relevant. I mean, we just, there's been too many people vaccinated to know that, oh my gosh, you know, 0.001% of people are going to suffer some horrible complication. But it's not necessarily clear that there can't be some really long-term complication that doesn't show up for a year or two years or three years. So, um, and, and, and therefore, I think to your point, it is a reasonable point of concern to say, well, this is still very new and we don't have 10 years of data the way we would if this strategy were deployed through a traditional non-emergency use approach for something like influenza where we didn't have to rush because we have so many other strategies. So uh, my question is, what would you say to reassure somebody that in five years, we're not going to learn something horrible about inserting coronavirus mRNA into our cells? All right, so there's two ways I would answer that. The first is, um, can the, the messenger RNA in any way um, alter our DNA? Because that, I think that's at the heart of what people are worried about. And then that comes up later in some form or another. Um, that's not possible for three reasons. First of all, when the messenger RNA is taken up by cells in our body, it's primarily something called dendritic cells, which is the major kind of antigen presenting cell in your body that presents cells, presents antigens to the immune system, to the rest of the immune system. So it's taken up, it's in a lipid nanoparticle, the lipid nanoparticle is taken up in the cell, it's stripped away, and then that messenger RNA enters the ribosomal system, where like the other couple hundred thousand copies of messenger RNA that are in your cytoplasm, it's then translated to a protein. And that happens over, over days. And then the messenger RNA, like all messenger RNAs, breaks down and, and is no longer making that protein. So the question then is, can the messenger RNA get into the nucleus and, and in any way alter the DNA, which it cannot do for three reasons. First of all, it has to be able to cross the nuclear membrane, which, re which requires a nuclear access signal that it doesn't have. Secondly, even if it got into the, into the nucleus, it's RNA, it's not DNA. So in order to affect DNA, it has to be converted to DNA, which means which requires an enzyme like reverse transcriptase, which it also doesn't have. 
even if it was converted to DNA, which it can't because it can't cross the nuclear uh, membrane and it can't be uh, basically reverse, reverse transcribed back to DNA, it still has to insert itself into the DNA, which requires an integrase enzyme that it also doesn't have. So it's not possible. You have a better chance of developing X-ray vision after you've gotten this than you have of the mRNA in any way altering your DNA. Although I never understand why people, when they say that it alters your DNA, doesn't think it can alter your DNA for the good. You know, like making you Spider-Man, for example, or something like that. People never talk about that. So that's one, one, one thing. I, I think that's not possible. The second thing is long-term effects. I guess I would challenge, we, we have these discussions at the CDC a, a lot um, with people who have a lot of experience with this. Name that, that serious adverse event that's associated with vaccines that has not been picked up within two months of getting a dose. So, so, and there are. I mean, you know, vaccines like any medical product that have a positive effect can have a negative effect, including a severe negative effect. Um, and so, for example, um, the, the um, squalene adjuvant in influenza vaccine that was used in Europe for the 2009 pandemic, one of those vaccines, so-called Pandemrix, um, could actually cause narcolepsy. I mean, it was rare. It was about one per 55,000 people, but it was real. And it, it, again, occurred within six weeks of getting a dose. Um, the oral polio vaccine that was created by Albert Sabin to, to basically eliminate a polio from this country could itself cause polio. It could actually revert to essentially neurovirulent or wild type virus and cause polio again, what happened within a few weeks of a dose. Um, the influenza vaccine is a rare cause, roughly one per million. And for polio, it's about one per 2.4 million doses. But influenza, about one per million doses, um, can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an ascending paralysis, which can be severe and occasionally fatal. Again, occurs within six weeks of a dose. The yellow fever vaccine um, in a roughly one per million people, uh, depending on which strain you use, can cause something we call viscerotropic disease, which is a nice way of selling, saying yellow fever. I mean, the yellow fever vaccine can cause yellow fever in much the same way the oral polio vaccine could cause polio, again, within a week or so of getting the dose. So, so I don't know of that si serious side effect that, that causes long-term problems. Now, it is true that some of these, most of these side effects, all of these side effects are so rare that when they occur, they only occur when they're in tens of millions of people, and then you can see that. But, but uh, that's why for every vaccine, you, you, know, you have to wait for two months after the second dose or whatever the last dose is to make sure it's still safe. And that, that was true of all these vaccines going out. I mean, we're going to get to the issue, I think, later in this broadcast with Johnson Johnson vaccines. But again, that, that issue came up within two weeks of a dose. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that for the for the listener, we really highlight the salient point here, which I think is actually the first point that you made, because I do think that for most people who are... I think hearing a lot of misinformation, um, it's coming through the channels of people who don't really understand enough biology to to sort of explain exactly how messenger RNA is translated into protein. And of course, that's what we want here. And how we don't have any of the machinery to enable the reverse. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.